Okay, thank you all for coming, and welcome to the Interns Lightning Talks. So this year again, we have uh, a lot of Google Summer of Code interns, and I am very happy that some of them are here to tell us about their projects. So every one of those interns will now have... All right, Google Summer of Code and Outreachy, sorry. I sometimes forget this because I'm, I'm only uh, in, involved with all the GSOC stuff, usually. Um, so every one of those interns will have four minutes time to present his project. Um, the slides are already here. We have a wireless mouse for you, so you can walk around if you want. Just use the uh, left mouse click to go forward and the right one to go backward, if you want to go backward. Very simple. You can also just use arrow keys. And after your lightning talk, I have brought to you chocolate from Hamburg. Um, so you get out of here properly fed, right? Um, before the next... <laughs> before the next lightning talk happens, I will tell the name of the person after the next lightning talk. So the next person, please just stay at this side of the, uh, of the, of the stage and then you can come up quickly so we can go through this very quickly, okay? Then let's start. So the first talker is Atul Anand. All oh, right, I'm sorry. So I, I have one very important task for the audience. So when I raise one arm, I want you to do this. Can we all do this right now? Right, just this. Clapping with one finger, each hand. So it, it, is, it is a quiet noise to remind the speaker of his time running off, right? And when I, when I raise both my hands, then we just clap. So the speaker has no choice but to end his presentation, okay? So. Okay, great, we can do this. So, the first speaker is Atul Anand, and the speaker after is Alexandru Pandelea. Okay, hello everybody, my name is Atul Anand, and I am working on a project uh, that says proxies in network manager. So, and my mentor is David Udhas, Udhas sir, he's not here, I guess. So, yeah, he's here. So, okay. so that's the first page that uh, tells what actually is a proxy. Proxies are generally so that just I just wanted to speak. Uh, proxies are generally uh, as, as simply like a server that talks on behalf of clients to the main server that we are requesting to the um, to to the to get the resources. So that would that we have already a feature that we already have a feature in. Uh, in that when we click when we open a Firefox we can, we see a picture like this and that's that's for configuring proxies no people are I don't know people are using how many people are using this so that that's basically a simple uh, page for conf configuring the proxies but what happens when we when we try to configure proxies for uh, multiple connections so like when we are connected to uh, wireless and we are connecting to some other VPN. So all the proxy stuffs, uh, how, how, we, how Firefox will decide uh, to what proxies to choose and what to, uh, what to um, which proxy servers to choose. So, so that's, that's what I did. Uh, I just implemented a gen generic, generic page for each of the connections. So there's a page for VPN, there's a page for wireless. So you can configure just uh, each page for each of the connections and that's fine and that is going to work. So they are not going to mingle to each other. So uh, everything is going to work smoothly. So that's that's the uh, tab in NM Connection Editor. It's the GUI that that we see in uh, Fedora and uh, Genome. That's that's it. And it it will be available in NM 1.4. That is going to release at the end of this month. So, and this is what we have. I have actually implemented this. This is actually. The, I, the project is basically designed designed by uh, fixing two packages. It's one is network manager, the basic network manager that we uh, that is default network manager in Fedora and every Linux platforms. That is, and one other is a page runner. It is a project that is from the Conman team, yeah, and it is for 
for actually it is it does the actual parsing of uh, javascript files and that's it so we are just sending our every details that that and network manager is collecting from the internet and that it is just pushing to the page runner so page runner is the basic interface that applications is going to uh, ask this and page runner will reply so network manager just configures page runner and page runner will uh, reply to uh, questions proxy question to everybody that is going to every application that is going to ask thank you that's the project Okay, the, uh, the next person is Amisha Singla. Okay, and no, after you. So, so the, the next, next person, right? If, if you know the software ver verification uh, notation. Uh, so now we have Alexandru Pan Pandelia, correct? Uh, with Nautilus and battery naming. Yeah. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Alex, and uh, this summer I've been working on implementing a battery name for Nautilus under the mentorship of Carlos Soriano. Uh, let's first start with a question. Why was this necessary? So let's imagine the following situation. Uh, we arrive from vacation and we upload our photos from our camera to our computer and the photos have a completely irrelevant name from which we understand nothing and we'd like to change that. Until now, we could do, uh, do that by downloading some auxiliary um, battery naming software, though uh, most people don't do that because it takes a lot of time to download and learn how to use that. And, but now you can do that much easily uh, directly from Nautilus. So this is how the dialog looks like after launching a batch, name, a batch naming operation. So the original file name is a tag and there are also other tags which I'll explain later. Uh, so you, now you can add text before the tag, so you will append something before the name or right after. So to make you understand better, I'm going to give you an example. So here uh, we have numbering followed by a certain name we want to give and uh, some metadata, uh, though uh, this is only available if every file has it. Now, uh, this is uh, uh, some menus. Um, the first one in the left is uh, for sorting. Uh, if the user doesn't like the initial order of the files, he can change it. And uh, uh, the other menu is, the, is representing the tags that the user can add. So the numbering and the, the original file names uh, are always available. And uh, there is also uh, the metadata that uh, each file has it. Okay, so this is the other mode, the replace mode. So here you can, um, you add the text that you want to replace and the replacement. And uh, then the uh, replaced part will be highlighted so that you can uh, easier, see, e that you can see easier what will happen. Okay, so another part is handling conflicts. Uh, for instance, when a, a new name would conflict with an existing file, uh, those rows uh, would uh, get highlighted. And also a label with two buttons would pop up so uh, that you can use the buttons to navigate through all the conflicts so that you can change the name to a better one. So that was all, thanks for listening. Uh, don't forget your chocolate, but if you forgot it, you can take it afterwards. People always forget it. Uh, so now we have uh, Amisha Singla with adding print route support for GNOME Maps. Hello, myself Amisha. Uh, so I'm currently working as a software developer in a company called Mapbox. Yeah, so it's again related to the maps. Uh, yeah, so uh, as a part of my outreachy project, I interned with GNOME Maps and being mentored by Jonas Janelson and Damien Oils. Though they are not here right now, I'm missing them, but other maps people are here and also the other 
I mean, like gnome people. And so, yeah. So let's talk about uh, why. Like, why are we adding print support for gnome maps? Like, say, uh, you're not having any working internet, or you're not having any smartphones. Like, then what will you do? So, so now it comes into the picture. Like, can we have something like uh, all the instructions of you know all the instructions somewhere printed? So, so that we can like we can when, whenever we're going for a travel, so we can just like follow that particular route. So that's why that's how like the idea came up, and like we integrated this uh, feature in GNOME Maps. So yeah, so this is how it looks. Like you just can add, like you can click on the print route button, and it will give you something like, uh, yeah. So you can print it a file, and it, this is how the output looks like. So you have this complete map view, and this this shows you the complete like from point to uh, like. Uh, and from point, wire points, and two points, and also the instructions like uh, over it. And then like you have this minimap. So basically, what minimaps is like uh, it consists of the route, like the part of the route, like uh, only only the places like where you start from and where you end to, and from some uh, and for the wire points. Like basically, this idea was proposed uh, so that like uh, whenever user starts from any particular you know, say city, so the Area. I mean, the routes are a bit, you know, complex over there when you're just like heading to some highway. So it's not required. Like all this mini mini maps are not required there. So yeah. So that's how we thought of it. And uh, like we had just instructions, uh, uh, instructions for like all the path and just mini maps from four points, five point, and two points. And now this is uh, like this is uh, another design for uh, like the small, the small. Route routes like where we don't need any minimaps because we are able to see the complete route in the com map view itself. Uh, yeah. So what did I use for getting it done? So these are some libraries uh, for which like I made use like GTK print API. Then there is Cairo and Pango Cairo. So frankly speaking, like I was really not aware of these libraries when I started with like uh, I uh, sub st uh, like submitted my application, but uh, like later somehow in the in the program itself, I learned all these libraries and get it done. So like this is like a major learning experience while you know doing the project. Uh, yeah. So I also uh, learned like write writing good code because I know like how badly I used to code like without commenting, without indentation, and all this stuff. Like GNOME actually made me you know do learn all this stuff and also approaching people for help like. How to how to keep how to be patient on IRC and you know asking people for help and other and also like uh, helping other people to get involved in the community because I myself know that like what are the troubles which I face like uh, while getting into the community so yeah and also a little of reviewing and you know sharing this with all of you in this conference so yeah that's it thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Now we have Carla Quintana Carrasco. Yeah. And afterwards, we have Gabriel Ivascu. And this is about visual and graphic design. Yeah. Hi, all. I'm dying here, so please be gentle. <laughs> so my work here on GNOMES is to improve the visual design and I do it uh, through corporate identity. And I don't mean, with corporate, I don't mean uh, uh, enterprise, I mean uh, a brand, to improve the brand. So this is a, a quote of one of my favorite uh, designers, uh, which explains what corporate identity is. So basically, it, it says that they are the elements who enforce uh, a brand and people recognize it. So the three areas that I'm uh, act, act, action it is the color, the graphic elements, and typography. So first, I did an analysis with all the white uh, color palette that is being used, and is a lot of confusing. So I, with the help of my mentor, <laughs> 
I did a, a smaller palette with one main color, the blue one, and four for a supplementary color. And typography, same as the color, it was a huge, huge use of uh, type fonts. So we basically uh, tied up to one, the, Sans, the Source Sans Pro, uh, to the lightest version. And the graphic elements, they are also very, very variated. So I choose this uh, triangle partner pattern to to establish the design, the designs elements to make it more simpler to reproduce. So this is the the examples of the all these three main uh, designs that I did, and that's the business card, the letters, basic stationery, greeting cards, and the main goal in this project is to uh, do uh, a manual with a guideline style to uh, strain the, the brand. Thank you. I take my chocolate. Julian Radu. Okay. So next we have Gabriel Ivascu with Web Bookmarks and Sync. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gabriel, and this summer I've been working on introducing a bookmark sync feature for Web Epiphany with the help of my mentor Michael. Um, and also with the hope that it can be later extended uh, to also sync uh, passwords, history, and maybe open tabs in the near future. Um, since every form of sync implies the existence of a server, I had to choose uh, whether to use uh, own cloud or Mozilla for this purpose. Uh, together with my mentor, we concluded that Mozilla is a better option because it would allow users to sync data with their servers with only a Firefox account and no configuration required, while on cloud would require the users to set up their own server. Throughout the sync process, I had to interact with three of the Mozilla servers, the Firefox account server, the token server, and the storage server. Each of, each of these servers are HTTP based. Uh, most of the requests going to the server have to be hook authenticated. Um, Hook is a HTTP authentication scheme uh, based on HMAC uh, digests of the requests and responses. It covers the HTTP method, the request URI, the host, and optionally the request payload. Also, the clients have to encrypt their data before uploading to the server. The first server that I had, that I had to deal with is uh, the Firefox account server. Uh, this supports both authenticate, authenticated and unauthenticated requests. It validates the sign-in and the sign-up requests and initiates a new session. Uh, it also returns the uh, session token that um, will be further used to obtain a signed browser ID certificate. Uh, moreover, it will return a key fetch token that uh, we will use to um, retrieve the sync keys that are going to use to be used to encrypt the data that is going to be sent to the storage server. Here you can see a screenshot of the um, Firefox iframe loaded in a WebKit web view inside the preference dialog of Epiphany. The users are going to use this form to um, create a new account or to sign in with, a, with an existing account. The second server is the token server. Um, this enforces a browser ID assertion based on the signed browser ID certificate obtained from the Firefox account server. Uh, its sole purpose is to, re to return the storage endpoint together with the storage credentials. Uh, what we basically do here is that we create a browser ID assertion that we are going to trade um, for these credentials. Finally, the third server is the actual storage server. 
Uh, this allows only authenticated access through hoc signed requests uh, using the credential obtained from the token server. Um, it stores the data as JSON objects organized into named collections. It also tracks the elementary metadata, providing um, a last time modified timestamp that clients are <coughs> going to use to query the server when they are going to ask for changes. <coughs> Since it does not uh, support push notifications, um, this is going to be, uh, what I mean is that the, the most complexity of the most complexity of the sync is going to fall in the responsibility of the client, which is okay. Um, that was it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Razwan Hitu. I work on that. Uh, so next we have Julian Radu with Web Bookmarks Subsystem Update. Hello everyone, my name is Julian and uh, my project was Web Bookmarks Subsystem Update and my mentor is Michael. Uh, the main um, idea uh, behind this project was to implement uh, a new bookmark system but uh, also uh, preceding that I also had to port uh, a part of code from uh, GTK action to G action. Um, this actually took a, long, uh, a lot longer than I expected but uh, because uh, at the start I uh, tried to do everything at once and it didn't really work out. Uh, but in the end, uh, I took a more uh, action by action approach and uh, it worked out. <laughs> okay, for the bookmarks uh, system, it's uh, much simpler than the previous one. Um, I decided to start everything from scratch uh, because the previous one was too complicated and was a readable read box. Uh, there are basically bookmarks and tags, and the bookmark can have multiple tags, and uh, then you can use to quickly browse to through your, uh, through your uh, bookmarks. Uh, I saved everything to disk using uh, GVDB, and um, I do all these uh, changes uh, when uh, the user changes a bookmark or adds a new one or removes one. And also, everything gets saved when uh, uh, the browser syncs data with the uh, Mozilla servers. Okay, these are some um, uh, screenshots. This is the add bookmark popover. Uh, you can access this from the um, location entry at uh, the top of the browser just by pressing the star. Uh, you can uh, set the, the title and uh, its tags. You can also add uh, more tags. This is the popover. You can find a list of all uh, existing bookmarks. Uh, there's also the tag stack inside the popover. Here you can find uh, all the existing tags and at the end uh, all the bookmarks that have no, no tag. Uh, clicking a tag will um, uh, switch to the tag details stack that displays a list of all uh, tags that have um, that bookmark. And this is the bookmark proper, uh, properties dialog then you can, that you can access by uh, pressing the um, wheel at the end of the row. Uh, here you can uh, change the title and the tags again uh, and also the address. And um, there's also a few more things to do. Uh, add a bookmarks migrator. This should um, read uh, the old uh, bookmark database file and uh, add the bookmarks to the new system. Uh, there's already support for that. I just have to write one more function. Uh, I have to update the location entries completion model. Uh, so each time you search for something, uh, you can also get uh, suggestions from uh, the existing bookmarks. And uh, I have to, because um, 
I also have to implement implement the new location entry design because currently to access the location entry and the star, so you can bookmark the page, you first have to click um, on the title uh, on the title head bar. Yes, that's all. Thank you. Now we have Rasvan Kitu. No, that's, it was, it was almost good. Okay, well, and, and afterwards we have uh, Rares Visalom. Visalom, okay. Uh, with compressed files in Nautilus. Hello everyone, I'm Rezvan actually, and I have been, <laughs> I have been working on adding support to compressed files in Nautilus under the mentorship of Carlo Soriano and Cosimo Cecchi. So, archives are basically folders, so naturally users would expect to be able to work with them right from their file manager. Now, on top of this, why would anyone want to actually work with them in a compressed format? Uh, archive managers hide a lot from the user. For example, file roller will usually decompress stuff on a hidden location on your system and will probably never delete it. You can check that. Uh, the first feature I implemented as part of my project was extraction. Uh, we are going to offer the same two options that are available now in file roller. Extract here will just output the files to the current directory and extract to will, do, uh, will uh, ask the user to select a location at first. Uh, what we did different with extraction is that we will always make sure that only one item gets created. Uh, the item created will always have the same name, the same name as the source archive. In this way, it will be really e it will be a really easy task to select it uh, to find it once the operation is complete. Uh, on top of this, we'll have integrated progress feedback so the user can track the operation, and at the end of the operation, the file will be automatically selected, making it an even easier task. With extraction in Nautilus, we move on to the next uh, point, uh, the next uh, feature implemented as part of my project. Now, the main idea of the project was to encourage users to uh, work with their files in a regular format. We decided that the best way to, do, to achieve this is to make extract here the default option for when opening archives. Uh, it takes about the same time to extract a regular archive that it takes to open archive managers like file roar, so why not do it from the beginning? This is the advantage that all the content in the archive will be available right from the start to do any operation without any other uh, drawbacks that compressed formats have. Uh, moving on to the next feature, which is compression. Uh, this functionality will work in, simil in a similar way with, a different, uh, with an existing operation in Nautilus, which is new folder with selection. Uh, Users are expected to just uh, select a few files and then right click and choose compression. Now, at this point, we run into a little problem because we could not decide on what UI to use for selecting the compression option. Uh, here is a design that we took uh, from file roller, but as you can see, it displays a lot of options which are most likely going to never be used. So, uh, I asked Alan Day to help me, and he actually suggested this mock-up, which uh, has the advantage of guiding the user with suggestive descriptions, and yeah. Uh, but this one had the problem too, as we showed it on IRC and immediately after people started arguing that we are not displaying enough options. So what are we supposed to do? Yeah, if anybody has an idea, please uh, be, uh, make sure you will tell it to us because you really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So while this project might be over soon, uh, work on compressed files is not uh, yet completed. Uh, a lot of users have requested a, an uh, option to export the contents of an archive without actually decompressing it. And this is already possible to give VFS the archive a backend, but it has a problem. It lacks write support, and we are not yet sure if we should implement this or not. But anyway, that's all for now, so thank you very much. Thanks. So uh, afterwards we have Zaiful, uh, Seiful, okay. And now we have Rares Vissalom. 
uh, with Polari improve the user experience, correct? Yeah. Great. Hello, my name is Radish, and I have spent my summer working for Polari. Oh, wait a second. Oh, yeah. Right. So I have worked on Polari this summer in, on improving the user experience. My mentors are Florian Müller and Bastian Ilso, to whom I owe, I owe a lot of things. I have stressed these guys a lot during this time. So I will first start out with the first feature. Uh, actually, my work involves two main features. The user tracker, which is not visually available to the user, but it works in the backend. And the user popovers that we are going to talk about next. So this is kind of the outcome of the user tracker. As you see, you, all that it does is enables the user, the, the, the client actually, Polari, to display the correct color of user nicks. So if, for example, the bugbot is always online, as you all know, and other users may be offline. This, uh, the user tracker enables you to kind of know which user is online in which room. Uh, this is kind of the, the how I, uh, this is kind of, kind of the, uh, the hierarchy that works in the user tracker. First, we have the user, user status monitor that kind of spawns user trackers for each and every account or, or networks as you know it. So for example, we would have a different account for a different user tracker for irc.gnome.org for Freenode and for any other account. The reason for this separation will be detailed a few, sli a few slides next. So the need for the new user tracker module. Why did we need it? First of all, the first uh, user tracking code that we had did its job very well, but it did not enable us to kind of uh, develop the popovers that are, we are going to talk about next. There was no actual status. It was just the color of the nicknames and the actual nick tags that are in the chat view enabled us to track their status. So I will move on to the next feature, which are the user popovers, as you see. Whenever you click on a nick, this popover, popover pops out, of course, and you kind of you are presented with a spinner that kind of loads until the, fer the first data is fetched from the server. You have a, uh, an option to message to privately message the the user and to view his past activity. Also, his nickname and his status are displayed above. Now, whenever the uh, the data loads, you are first presented with the last activity, which usually is pretty recent if the user is online and his real name, if he has said it prior to your, to this opening of the pop-up. Now I'm going to talk about the statuses that the user tracker tracks. First of all, we have the global status, and then we have the local status. What does global status mean? Well, it means that that user is online in a, in a different room, other than the current one you are in, but you're still online in that room as well. So you're you are able to track its status across all the rooms that you're online in. And the local status, of course, is about the status in the current given room. So, first of all, this is the this is how the popover looks when the user is offline. And a cool feature we added is that we added an, a, a notification button, which is a toggle button actually. Whenever you press the button, you kind of enable Polari to get to give you a notification whenever that user comes online. This is pretty helpful. I mean, if you want to talk to a specific person but you're not sure when he or she will be online, you kind of press the button and you, can, and you wait for a notification. Of course, you can press the button again because it's a toggle button and you won't be prompted with a notification when the user appears online. When you press the button, the popover will show you that you are waiting for that user to come online. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> thank, you for reminding, thank you for reminding me. And yeah, this was my, actually my last slide, so this is where my presentation ends. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm in time. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Seful. Um, I'll be talking about the audio tag editor and no, mu no music. My mentors are Felipe Borges, who's here, and Carlos. I, I I'm not sure how he looks. Uh, oh, hey, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. So uh, my project has three parts. Uh, I suppose all of you know what a tag editor is supposed to look like. I mean, what a tag editor is in music. It lets you edit the details, metadata of your music files. Okay. So uh, my project has three parts. First is the update backend. 
that is uh, actually not really Tracker, but I'm uh, sending Sparkle updates to Tracker. So Tracker already does uh, most of in file indexing and uh, metadata extraction. So it's it just makes sense that it it also uh, also should do the write back. So any update queries like delete, insert, where that you send to Tracker will result in an update to a physical file, uh, provided it's uh, the the format is supported. Okay. The next is the user interface. The user interface is a instant apply dialog for a single song. Uh, it will only support single songs at, at the moment, but I, I'm working on it. Uh, there are eight tags that can be edited. Title, album, artist, composer, genre, track, disc, and year. Uh, while when you, um, okay, well, let me show you the UI. Okay, when you press the edit details button for a selected song in the select mode, this uh, dialog pops up, all the entries can be edited. And um, meanwhile, in the background, all the data is being downloaded, uh, the automatic meta metadata, which will be uh, the best data. The first entry that we uh, fetch is um, just shown below the each of the entries so that you can apply it using that tick. I mean, the, actually the UI is still I mean, I'm not sure about it. It might change. It will change, actually. Uh, it, this screenshot is a bit, uh, uh, what do you say, old. OK, uh, this is the last part, the Grillo side. Uh, thanks to Victor for all the help. Though, rather than reading this, I'll just walk you through this. Uh, there's first the Chroma Print plugin that uses, the, uh, uses an algorithm from GStreamer to, uh, from Live Chroma Print to convert uh, to, to get a fingerprint from a music file, which is then passed on to the account ID plugin, which uses the string fingerprint and the duration as uh, parameters for a lookup and uses the web service to fetch the music brains ID, which is then again used by the music brains plugin to get all the other met metadata. So that, that about covers my project. Uh, it, this can be much better, like multiple songs and whole album editing. Uh, and Music Brains is having some sort of trouble with their server. You'll get all sorts of, if you run it from the command line, you'll get all sorts of um, rate limit reached and service un unavailable replies. Uh, but I, I, I think they're working on it and they'll get, uh, they'll do a revamp soon. Tracker has this error, write back error that only the first uh, the first update works on the, on that file, and after that, only the DB is updated. I think maybe Carlos is working on it. Okay, and there are a few UI and update bugs that that are entirely my responsibility. And I hope you'll use it and report any and all bugs that you'll find. Thank you. I'm done. Okay. Thanks. Yes, take your chocolate. So now we have Umang Jain, 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 Jain sorry, uh, with uploading photos to Google. So hi, uh, I'm Umang Jain, and uh, my GSOC project was uploading photos to Google, uh, GNOME photos. Uh, my mentor was Debashi Izia, and uh, uh, so disclaimer, there is no text in your slide in my slides, only just the screenshots, and I'll walk you through what, what was the project all about. So after the major feature addition of editing cycle in uh, for the 3.20 cycle of G uh, GNOME photos, the major feature was missing was like the user was not able to share his photos to other sources. So basically, this this was the starting point. And, uh, and basically, we uh, decided to uh, uh, exp uh, share photos to the Google, Google Photos of Picasa. Picasa is now deprecated and only we have Google Photos now. So basically, how it works is uh, we have a SharePoint manager. And this dialogue, what, what you can see is uh, communicates to the SharePoint managers. And for each, uh, for each, we have email and Google. So these both are share points. These are just the derived classes. 
and uh, how this is being added is from google online accounts so if you add a google online account you will get a google and you if you add a facebook you will get a facebook like uh, it, it it is very extensible we will extend this to uh, bluetooth sharing and uh, facebook sharing in the future so so basically this talk would i will uh, like partition into two parts and one was the sharing which was my project and another what was the problem i faced while implementing this feature so it uh, you know, like the interesting part was the solving that problem right so in gnome photos uh, when you add an online account it will fetch all the if you add a google account it will fetch all your photos from the google and it will show you in the overview mode so like you you get like it's a manager photo manager so uh, while uh, you are uploading a photo to google the application doesn't know that that it has been uploaded from the same application right same source like the local photo so what uh, what we faced is like then you have the online online miners in gnome photos will fetch the uploaded image the recent uploaded image and will update the ui so what you finally get is your local image and your remote image which is exactly the exactly the same so uh, to solve that problem uh, what we did was after the upload has been uh, the uh, the pic has been up, uh, uploaded successfully we would uh, enter we would insert a remote object into the trackers database manually with the same identifier so that the uh, so that uh, and uh, also after inserting it we would relate that so basically there is a mapping from remote object to the local object and in the view model we just check if an uh, urn if an object has a related to property as set we we would just skip skip uh, we would just avoid that object to come up into the overview mode because gnome photos also supports uh, like um, additional features like as searching uh, advanced features like when you when you you can get all the images from google only or facebook only like filtering so if we totally miss out the object it would not get filtered so so that was the uh, trade off i have to take in mind so uh, so there is nothing there this is uh, sharing from the selection mode and uh, if you are previewing the photo you can just also share from that so basically that was it uh, thank you and uh, big thanks to debashi thank you hello okay so a big thanks to all the interns uh, you are doing great projects and we love that you're with us in the community so i think that's that's worth a round of applause isn't it